Welcome to Global Evangelistic Center here in Kissimmee, Florida. And uh, this morning, if I had a message, uh, the message would be the ease of Christ's yoke. The ease of Christ's yoke. In your Bibles, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30 reads, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. That sounds mighty good this morning. <laughs> For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, now, some people, they, they, they read this scripture, and they forget just how powerful this scripture is. Because who we have talking to us through this scripture is none other than Yeshua HaMasiah. The one who found his way down Golgotha <laughs> after being whipped and scourged after the passion in the garden, after realizing that he would have to go through Calvary to work the work of God's redemption. So here we have Someone that had to go through something like we have to go through things at times. And he's not telling you that he's given you a get out of stress or get out of trials or get out of challenges. God, he's telling you that if you learn to lean on him, his yoke is easy because he will sustain you. In the complete Jewish Bible, it says, Come to me, all of you who are struggling and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light now here at GEC we have been in a series regarding uh, understanding living in the freedom of Christ which comes from us bearing each other's burdens which Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 tells us fulfills the law of Christ this bearing of each other's burdens is an act of love. <laughs> it means you're supposed to be as the body of Christ. There for each other when times get rough, when times get challenging, we're supposed to be there to speak encouragement and to help each other when there is a need to be helped. Hmm. Amen? Amen? This bearing of each other's burdens is an act of love. And as the complete Jewish Bible puts it, this is the fulfillment of the Torah's true meaning. Now, in this series, the easiness of Christ's yoke comes from us learning to totally love God with our whole being, our will, our emotions, our intellect, our whole heart, our whole soul, and our whole strength. As the Shema says, Hey ho Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And you shall love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy all thy strength. <laughs> it's supposed to be an all-encompassing love where you are so in love with God that when you turn your eyes on Jesus and you look full in his glorious face, the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. <laughs> the easiness 
of Christ's yoke is most clearly understood by us applying the principles of the law of liberty to reap the benefits of our engrafted inheritance. Now remember, we're engrafted into that Judaic tree, and there are specific promises of blessings, of increase that come to us from our engrafting. Amen? Now we've got to learn to apply the principles of the law of liberty to reap the benefits of our engrafted inheritance, but without the bondage of the law that demands us to do or continue to misunderstand certain acts and certain rituals as a means of salvation while hiding the true significance of the act. Uh, in my last message, we covered the law of liberty. There are principles of the law of liberty. There is the this law is something that we <coughs> have to learn and practice. It is the operational directions to ensure that we please God. Uh, operational directions to ensure our reaping the benefits of God's promises. In James 1 and 25, we find this law of liberty. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now you see, what we've got to understand is exactly what this liberty is. Because in the Greek translation of that word liberty, the original Greek word is el eutheria. El you there uh, I liken it to the country I come from, Eleuthera. <laughs> but basically what that is saying is uh, under the operation of the law of the principles of liberty, we have the liberty to do or to admit things having no relationship to salvation. True liberty is living as we should, not as we please. The, the other principle of the law of liberty and where we're at today is fully understanding the freedom of Christ's yoke. Now, uh, this morning I want to take another look at the easiness of Christ's yoke. Because sometimes we can get very heavy laden with a variety of stressful issues and cares of this world. But Jesus wants us to be stress and worry free. Amen. <coughs> Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 to 30. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, first of all, the proper contextual reference of the scripture shows it as a rebuke against the spirit of religion and as a rebuke to those that consider themselves to be so wise that they cannot repent because some people think they are smarter than God. <laughs> and if you think you're going to get them to repent, you got another thing coming. Because... <laughs> The gospel can be as deep as you want or as shallow as you need. And you've got to get to a point where you accept the simplicity of Christ's message. Because the bondage uh, of these people that have a problem repenting, their intellectuality gets in the way. And the justification of years of tradition 
gets in the way for them and blocks them from getting the redemption that they need. This labor that Christ is talking about as the original Greek word for labor is kopi, kopiaho. Kopiaho. It shows us that it means to grow weary, tired, exhausted with toil or burdens or grief, to labor with wearisome effort, to toil of bodily labor. Now, now, once we understand the contextual reference of this scripture and the proper definition of this word labor, we will realize that God is not telling us not to work hard because hard work is one of the keys to success. I remember the song said, the only thing comes to a sleeper is a dream. <laughs> Amen. Psalm 128 verse 2 shows us that, for thou shalt eat the labor of thine hand. You ain't going to eat from slothfulness. You ain't going to eat from laziness. You shall eat of the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. So this is not a cop-out for laziness, because it will take hard work to build your vision and even to complete your God-given assignment. I believe there are some people in here this morning that God has given an assignment to. And you're getting that vision that God gave you is only the beginning. <laughs> God gave that land to the Hebrew people in Israel and it ain't like they're sitting on it in peace. You're going to have to learn to fight for what God gives you. Amen. Hmm. But all while you are doing it, you've got to keep things in the right perspective. Sister Omi, Psalm 127 verses 1 to 2. Because if you don't, and if you refuse to put God first, then you are wasting your time with all that you are trying to do. Psalm 127, verses 1 to 2. Sister Omi. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. So if you're his beloved, you shouldn't be staying up and can't sleep. Now, there come certain times when you get so busy like I was where I didn't get any sleep. The pastor was cooking and doing various other things. <laughs> and I got started late. There come some times when you lose sleep. But it should not be a regular pattern to where when you go to bed, you lie in, in bed and you can't sleep because you bugged and you paranoid. This scripture is so awesome because when you really look at it, <laughs> except the Lord build a house, it's telling you that no matter what you're trying to do, I don't care how fantastic a program or how fantastic a vision or how fantastic a mission or whether it is a beautiful church, except the Lord build a house, they that labor, labor in vain. God has got to come first, and he's got to be the one that builds a house because he is the one that gives the vision for it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all things, whatever. Whatever you want with regards to what God is telling you to do shall be added unto you. Except the Lord build a house, they labor. And that's a shame because some people, they work so hard, but they refuse to put 
God first means all their labor is in vain. It's a waste of time. It's cheaper you stay in bed if you ain't putting God first. <laughs> Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Now understand what this is saying. Even if the watchman waketh, if God ain't in control of that city, even if the watchman waketh, it makes no sense. Because it's God who brings the protection. It's God who is the Lord of hosts who will fight for you. If God ain't on your side, you could wake and see all sorts of things. But if he ain't on your side, you got no power to do anything about it. The watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early. You just as well stay in bed because you're out of whack. <laughs> Sometimes we can get so busy with a good thing. Not every good thing is a God thing. Sometimes we can get so busy with a good thing, but it may not be what God has called for to be built. Or the way that God wants to build it. Because God has a style and a way all of his own. When you look at the temples, they were built to specificity. We can get so busy building a house, but it may not be the type home that God wants built. Kendrick, get ready. Second uh, Kings chapter 2, verses 9 to 15. See, we can get so busy building a house, but if God has not called for it to be built the way that he wants, See, there's a difference, and hear me well. There's a difference in carrying a mantle and laboring under a burden. With a mantle, it is a gift and a calling of God that comes over a person to empower them to accomplish a specific task for God's kingdom. Kendrick. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9 to 15. And so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, hmm. what may I do for you before I, before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be, it shall not be so. Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated, and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elisha saw it. And, when he, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. So he saw, so he saw him no more, and he took hold of his crown, took hold of his own clothes, and tore them into, into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he, and when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that way, this way and that, and Elijah crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed and bowed to the ground before him. See, you got to understand the mantle of a prophet of God, the mantle of someone that is carrying an anointing. I can tell you personal experiences about the mantle. Because the first time I felt the mantle drop over my shoulders, I was before... A hell-raising church. <laughs> and I'd gotten up to speak, and these young people, they had no respect for the man of God. <laughs> I've been in some situations now. Pastor didn't always just preach a nice pastor's message. <laughs> and when I got up, the pastor had to get up and say, listen to him. This is a man of God. But I tell you what, the first time I felt the mantle and the anointing drop over me, it was like a warm cloak. 
It was as if someone had taken my talit and just enveloped me in it. And the power of God came. Suffice it to say, just about all them young people who were up to the altar when God got finished with what he had to say. See, there's a reason I ask you to read that. <laughs> you got to be in the right place at the right time for the mantle of the anointed. If you come under the anointing, you will catch what's in the mantle. In the days of the biblical prophets, the mantle was the official garment of the prophet. I believe there are some people here that are going to receive what God has for you. Some people here that are faithful. <laughs> God has a special blessing for you. The mantle in the days of the biblical prophets automatically marked a man as a prophet, a spokesman of God. It was also a symbol of sacrifice and commitment. Back in those days, it ain't like what we see in Hollywood today. The life of a prophet was no life of luxury. To where are we going to extravagance and expect people to be worshiping us instead of worshiping God. The life of the prophet was not a life of luxury. When we look at uh, prophets like Elijah, whose name means Yahweh is my God, and see that he lived up to the expectancy of his name, as it was a confession, and as a bearer of that name, Yahweh is my God, a bearer of that bold confession, he defended Yahweh uh, against the worshippers of Baal and of other gods. Some Jewish scholars are of the school of thought that he took this name himself. Uh, now, however it happened, uh, this remains a testimony even unto this day that when we make that bold confession of our faith, we will be called upon to defend what we confess and believe because there will be a battle, a challenge, and a struggle by the adversary. But there is a mantle in the name of Yeshua. The mantle on Elijah empowered him to perform awesome miracles, which included raising the dead, bringing fire down from the sky, and having himself be taken up by a whirlwind. The mantle represents a man or woman's gift, the call of God and the purpose for which God has called us. So then, if we understand that a mantle of God describes the calling and anointing of the person, then we understand that a mantle is not a burden. Amen? A burden is something that is carried that is emotionally difficult to bear. Burdens can weigh us down. Burdens can oppress us. And when you're doing spiritual warfare over some Christians that are oppressed, you have to break through the heavens to break the oppression over their lives. Burdens can overload us. From the days of the exodus of the Hebrew people from the bondage of the Egyptians, we see God showing us that he is a burden bearer and does not desire for us to be oppressed by the burdens that we may be carrying in this life. Exodus 6 and 7, and I will take you to me for a people. He's talking to the Hebrew people, but we receive that from our engrafted insight. And I will take you to me for a people engrafted promise of our inheritance 
and I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, Egyptian bondage is also symbolic to Christians of anything that might hold us in addiction or enslaved to the flesh. See, the difference when you're dealing with that is when you have a mantle on you. Ten years of psychology is gone by the wayside because when the anointing of God is present, you can lay hands and break curses over people's lives. Like the Hebrew people. Sometimes we can be enslaved so long that we cannot think like free people. Perhaps you may consider it an impossibility to ever be free from your condition. But the mantle that fell upon Yeshua is available to you today to set you free from any stronghold of the devil. The prophet Isaiah who lived over 700 years before the birth of Jesus prophesied about the mantle in which he would come. Isaiah 61 verse 1. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. <laughs> Isaiah prophesying. 61 verse 1. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. This is a messianic prophecy. 700 years before Messiah would come. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted. To proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Over 700 years later, Yeshua walked into that synagogue in Nazareth where he had been brought up amongst the people there. Rolled up the scroll after reading the scripture in Luke chapter 4 verses 20 to 21 need that in an amplified version. Sister Sonia, Luke chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. And when he rolled up the scripture, he told the congregation there that today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The people there had taken him for granted because of their familiarity with him, which blocked their ability to see who he really was in the spirit. The first thing that falls out of their mouth was shock and unbelief. Luke chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. Sister Sonia. And he began to speak to them. Today this scripture has been fulfilled while you are present and hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the words of grace that came forth from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? So he said to them, you will doubtless quote to me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself. What we have learned by hearsay that you did in Capernaum. Capernaum. Do here also <laughs> in your own town. <laughs> My God. <clears throat> Even though uh, they spoke well of him. What caused them to be so marveled or amazed at the words of grace that came out of his mouth was the authority and anointing in which he spoke it. In other words, he owned what he said. <laughs> you see, when you are speaking to demons, when you are speaking to principalities, you can't be backing up and saying, it would be nice if you'd come out. You got to have authority. I have never cast out a demon by asking him to please depart. <laughs> they don't listen to that. You got to own what you say. In the matchless name of Yeshua, Hamasiah, legions come out. You got to own what you say. You see, here we are. 
at that uh, synagogue. <laughs> and even though they, and it sounds harmless because they spoke well of them, they still were in amazement because of the commonality of his human breeding. In other words, he wasn't what they expected him to be. Is not this Joseph's son? Joseph the carpenter? <laughs> you see, we have to be careful of people that uh, butter us up with flattering words, but are really insulting our intelligence. Because if the light of truth was to hit that person, what you would really see is someone that cannot appreciate what God has created in you or what you may even find is someone that thinks they are so much better than you and have truly underestimated your wisdom. I can't tell you the amount of times I have been underestimated. <laughs> and guess what? I stay under the shadow of the Almighty. I step forward and forth and did what God told me to do. Don't let people underestimate you. Don't let people look down on you and talk to you from the top of their nose. <laughs> underestimate. <laughs> or even they may be thinking you don't have the right to the things that God has blessed you with. This is your things now. <laughs> you got to be careful of these subtle people with flowery words. Luke 4 and 22. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? See, familiarity is one of the greatest blocks to people receiving gifts that come in their midst. Because familiarity will always breed contempt. Some people have an anointing right in the front of you. And you can't appreciate what you have. <laughs> Until it's gone, I always say, two things that are best appreciated in your rearview mirror, a good town and a great person. <laughs> People are too often drawn by sensation and the showtime of the spectacular to embrace the true gifts and blessings of the spirit that often fall right in the center of their midst. Contempt. The state of being despised, dishonored, or disgraced is not this Joseph's son. This was not a compliment to his stepfather, <laughs> but a subtle question of Christ's authority based upon their familiarity with him. Luke 4 and 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So he was brought up in these people's town, and he was all the time in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So they watched little Joseph growing up, little Joseph's stepson, Jesus, growing up. They said, it's not, it's, wait, hold on a second now. Who, who is this? <laughs> There was and is a mantle on Jesus to set the captives free. Regardless of how long they have been bound. The woman with the issue of blood had been bound for 12 years and had spent all of her money on doctors who could not help her. <clears throat> Before she touched the hem of Christ's garment, Sydney. I want you in complete Jewish Bible, Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 to 41. Twelve years this woman had been bound with this affliction, with this issue of blood. 
12 years. Spent all the money on these doctors. Seems like they were charging the same way they charge today. <laughs> Before she touched the hem of Christ's garment. And in an instant received her miraculous healing. She touched the tizit. The braids or tassels of Yeshua's talit. His precious Sydney. Numbers chapter 15 verses 37 to 41. Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 to 41, reading from the complete Jewish Bible. Adonai said to Moshe, Speak to the people of Israel, instructing them to make through all their generations tizut on the corners of their garments, and to put with a tizut on each corner a blue thread. It is to be a tizut for you to look at, and thereby remember all of Adonai's mitzvot and obey them, so that you won't go around wherever your own heart and eyes lead you to prostitute yourselves. But, but it will help you remember and obey all of my mitzvot and be holy for your God. I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt in order to be your God. I am Adonai, your God. So, so here we go. What she grabbed a hold of, that's why he said, who touched me? Because virtue came out of me. What she grabbed a hold of was all the promises of God and the tizit. She grabbed a hold of the power of God. Because the mitzvot were the commandments. She grabbed a hold of righteousness. You see unrighteous people? They can talk a good talk. And they can come with great theatrics. But the anointing is what delivers. And the anointing comes from virtue. A mantle is what sets us free from a burden but some people confuse a burden for a mantle hmm. some people confuse a burden for a mantle god will use a burden to activate your mantle your mantle comes with an assignment whereas your burden will point you into the direction of your god ordained purpose your burden is the calling of your purpose. But if it is carried as your mantle, then you will start to take on and carry the weight of your calling as if, as if it is the right and God-ordained thing to do. Some people are walking around heavy laden and God does not want that. God wants us to be able to walk through stress-free the sorrow of the poor will weigh you down with depression for their plight. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should turn a cold heart or be heartless towards the poor. <laughs> but you've got to understand how the mantle works with poor people. Whereas the mantle that rests upon our shoulders is to preach the good news of God's empowerment that can break the bad habits and generational curse of poverty that might have gotten them into their impoverished condition in the first place. Numbers 14 and 18. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. You see, some people, they screw up in this life. They do bad things. And then that bad thing that they've done becomes a curse that travels down the generations that needs to be broken. The mantle to preach the good news of God's empowerment and salvation can break the curse of poverty. Sister Kira, get ready to read Proverbs chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. The mantle to preach the good news of God's empowerment and salvation can break the curse of poverty that may have been brought about by their disobedience to God's word. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 7 to 10.
Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the f first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So in, in other words, some people, they come up with their own logic and deduction as to why they should not honor the Lord with their substance. But the word of God says that if you honor God, it shall be held to your nerves and sinews. This is from the Amplified Version. And marrow and moistening to your bones. In other words, when you listen to what God is telling you to do, your health is preserved. And even when you walk through the valley in the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. Because God will be there with you. This is a covenant promise. God is saying that if you will be obedient to me, I will pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to hold. Your health will be cursed if you do not listen to what God is telling you. And that ain't pastor's words. That is the word of God. Sister Kelly, Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 to 11. You see, people, we got to get ready because I believe God has plans to bless us. I believe this is a season of harvest, but we have to be obedient and get the first things first. If you will not honor God, it ain't about me. If you will not honor God as God commands you, then you cannot look to him to bless you. Malachi chapter 3 verses 6 to. Say, for I, Jehovah, hmm. change not. Therefore, yea, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed from the days of your fathers. Ye have turned aside from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, said Jehovah of hosts. But ye say, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye rob me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with, with the curse. For ye rob me, even this whole nation. Bring ye the whole tide into the storehouse, that there may be food in thy house, and prove me now herewith, said Jehovah of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your wine cast its fruits before the time in the field, said Jehovah of hosts. See, when you rob God, <clears throat> what ends up happening is that you come out of covenant relationship with God. When you are in covenant relationship with God, the devourer is rebuked because that is a covenant relationship with one who has the power to rebuke the devourer. Hmm. There is a time to give and a way to do it. But the main purpose of the mantle is to break the curse of poverty. It is not about setting up a system for handouts or being burnt out by the sorrow of the poor. It is about preaching the empowerment of the gospel that breaks the spirit and mindset of poverty to truly set the captives free. Galatians 3 and 13 says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone 
who is hanged on a tree. When we confuse the burden with the mantle, we will get heavy laden by the depression of the broken hearted that can have a detrimental effect even on our own health. You see, when you don't have that mantle on you and you go into counseling people, you will take their weight on you. You got to, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying to be cold, but you got to, when people come and tell you all their sad stories and how they like to jump off the bridge and how they want to just, I just feel like just killing everybody. You, and <laughs> You, you see, you, you can't be taking all that into your spirit. And my, my daddy boxed me in my head. And, and hey, all that is sad and all that is, is bad. And, you know, and, and sh you got every right to be mad, but you got to learn to forgive. And you got to have that mantle on you to wear that don't get in hair. And it don't get in hair. When you start putting that stuff on your back, all of a sudden, you start going down. Hand down. And what they start doing, they start feeling good. Because <laughs> they're walking on the top of you. See, the mantle and the anointing of God will keep all that stuff from going into your inner man. That's why I always get dressed in the mantle of God's anointing. <laughs> the mantle that binds up the brokenhearted is his word that promises that he is near to us. No matter what we are going through, Psalm 34 and 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Psalm 55, verse 22. You see, you got to get the word in your mouth. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. That even when we do not understand what may be going on in our lives, we have got to trust and lean on him. Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. The mantle that binds up the broken hearted. Let's us know that God is good. And all the time he's good. I don't care what I'm going through. I get the word in my mouth. God is good. I'm above and not beneath. I'm healed in Jesus' name. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I don't care what I'm going through. The mantle will put the word in your mouth. I know about speaking to mountains and telling mountains to move. I've been in enough battles in my life to tell you that this ain't just something nice to listen to or to preach this stuff works and it's real come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest this labor warns us about growing weary tired exhausted with toil or burdens or grief but the laden is a warning about being weighted down with a burden, not just of useless traditions and the heaviness of the spirit of religion and the heaviness from other people whose burdens you're taking on, but of allowing the burden of our calling to become our mantle. But Jesus calls for us to take his yoke upon us and to learn of him. In other words, he is going to carry the weight that will bring healing, that will bring deliverance and fulfillment to where it needs to be because he is the one that created and will sustain the mantle. <laughs> the mantle will rest on your shoulders. That's why his yoke is easy and his burden is light. As I close, there are two powerful things that he describes that upholds his yoke. One is meekness. Now, meekness is not weakness. Because too many people think that Christians are supposed to be doormats. That they could just come up to you. And I've seen this on TV. 
And it only happens in certain churches. They can just come up in the middle and just slap the pastor. Wow! Suffering for the Lord. Now don't, don't um, pray for pastor because I can hit you back. Okay, see, that's the flesh part of me. I'd like to believe that my brothers here, if they see somebody crazy coming and walking up towards the... <laughs> that my brothers will... Um, well, stop them. Right, Kingsley? All right now. Because, uh, you know, uh, I got to be careful what I say, but I personally believe that any man that does not provide for his home is an infidel. But it ain't just providing financially. If you would sleep in your bed with your wife and you hear something downstairs and your husband talking about, sweetie, you want to go check that out? You need to boop some manliness into him we supposed to be the defender the protector yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen? amen meekness is not weakness it's submission and obedience to his word to where his will becomes our passion and our desire Isaiah 29 verse 19 it says the meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel Psalm 25 verse 9 the meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way meekness was one of the divine attributes that the people of Israel were told to look for in identifying their messianic king. Didn't tell them to look for theatrics and splendor. You want fireworks? Buy it. Matthew 21 and 5. Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a coat, the foal of an ass. But contempt was a major contributing factor in why they missed their blessing, why they missed their Messiah the first time that he came to us in the flesh. The second powerful thing that upholds his yoke is being lowly in spirit. That original Greek word is tapinos. It's used for the lowliness of spirit, and this is talking about walking in humility. Now, walk, me coming in here and walking all humble. Pastor, what's going on? I'm just humble. I'm just humble. I've seen enough phony people to understand that me looking all humble, humble isn't a look. Some people, they just start looking all humble. I've seen a lady, one time I went to see this lady preach. The sister was dressed at all white, and she looked down the whole time because she was too humble to look at the audience. I'm saying, what kind of stuff is this? <laughs> humble is not a look. I can't tell you, okay, you know, you walk in all sanctimonious, and, you know, and you, it's the way you talk. Pastor, what's going on? Everything is relatively good. <sighs> That's called being phony. Some people, they're too, they're, too, they're, they're too falsely humble to even say thank you when they, and you give them a compliment. Say, man, you look good. Sister Army, you look great. Well, God has made me this way. <laughs> no! I woke up and I look at myself in the mirror and I said, I gotta fix this and I gotta fix that. I saw a person one time, I say, you, you gonna get, um, you gonna go get the ham or the turkey? He said, the Lord will show me. I said, what the Lord? Your belly should show you what you won't get. No, I'm not, no, don't get me wrong. I'm, I know some people, they, they like to consult the Lord for every decision. Uh, you know, and that's nice, all well and good, but certain things your common sense could tell you. Then people wonder why they find Christianity flaky and weird. Cause you got a lot of weird and flaky Christians. The metaphorical definition of it speaks about not rising far from the ground. Now this ain't that you walk around like this. 
He's talking about staying on your knees because it's hard to fall when you live on your knees. He's talking about having an attitude to where you don't think, I'm all that and a bag of chips. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> In other words, being broken. You, I could always tell when someone is broken because they don't have that arrogance about them. Some people, they walk into a room and you could tell they have the anointing of God all over them. Other people, they walk in the room and their, their head can't fit in that room. <laughs> they are legends in their own minds. When you are broken, then you are fit and ready to be used by God. After our own wills, and this is, this is where the transformation comes in. Our will has to be broken and it has to become His will. Yeah. Psalm 138 verse 6. My last scripture for today. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. But the proud he knoweth afar off. And see, we move in the spirit. So we could tell when proud people come in. We could tell when proud people come in. Sometimes pride takes on a false sense of humility. <laughs> you get in trouble here. Some people, they say, I'm too humble to wear a necktie. That really happened. <laughs> this fellow was in the corporate world. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. I'll probably get in trouble for that one. Anyway, prayer focus. Point one. If we are heavy laden <laughs> with stress, Jesus wants us to be free. If we are heavy laden with stress, I don't care where the stress comes from. Jesus wants us to be free. Point number two. For God to make our discernment so sharp that we never miss our blessing because of our contempt or lack of appreciation of the gift that God will put in your life. Mm. For God to make our discernment, you got to be able to discern certain people, certain anointings when they come into your life and don't take them for granted. You got to learn to appreciate the gift that you got. Some people, they, they got a gift and yet they still lust after a, a, another gift. God ain't going to give you no other gift until you appreciate what you got. We got to pray for God to make our discernment so sharp that we never miss our blessing because of our contempt or lack of appreciation of the gift that God gives us. And my third and final point, we may, and this ain't for baby Christians, this for those of us that are trying to live right and, 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 and do what we feel God has called us to do. If I was in an auditorium, this would be something for pastors. But hey, here at GEC, we are eagles. Amen? We may have confused our burden with our mantle. And it's time to lay it down so we can allow Christ's yoke, which is his mantle, his anointing, to gently rest upon our shoulders. See, if you're going to be in ministry, like this here is the nucleus. God is going to do a great work. Hear me well with our group. But this is the nucleus. You got to have that anointing. It's no way under God's son as this ministry increases in size. And if we get to be hundreds of people, no way I'm going to be able to come and listen to everybody's unfortunate and sad story. So what's going to happen is you all are going to have to be empowered and move in the anointing to deal with people that need deliverance, to deal with people that need the word of God spoken into their life to where they can receive it and apply it. There's no way I can reach everyone 
This is Global Evangelistic Center. You all are the leaders. We are on an exciting trip. This is an apostolic move because I understand the apostolic mantle on my life. And those that are here at the nucleus of what God is doing in the kingdom, they are the ones that will be used to reach people. Amen? Amen. So you need to make sure that you got that mantle on your life. That you don't confuse burdens with the mantle. I believe it's time to lay down some of the things that we've been carrying. So the Christ yoke, which is his mantle, can just come and rest on our shoulders. If that's what you want this morning, I'm going to pray and I'm going to lay hands. And if you want God to do in the supernatural and in the spiritual what I have said, first thing we need to do is break stress. Stress for a believer. When I break it, I break the spirit of oppression. Because if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you should not be getting possessed. When every deliverance service comes about, you shouldn't be rushing up to, okay, let's work on the left legion. No. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, all that junk got to be out of your trunk. Amen? But what can happen is you could get oppressed now. Because certain things in life, just like how on a can, how gravity works and can press the can, you could ask how it can feel. You can feel oppressed. If you want the spirit of oppression to leave your life and to leave your home, meet me at the altar. If you want God to give you a keener sense of discernment to make it so sharp that you never miss your blessing of the gifts that God will put in your life, because God is going to be putting gifts in people's lives. Or if you want the mantle of God to rest on your shoulders, to wear all of that burden and worry and stress from other people that you may have to minister to, does not attach itself to you, and then you burn yourself out. Meet me at the altar this morning.